Today are art nerds, happy fall. I have another start to finish drawing to watercolor tutorial for you guys today. This one is a little bit Rin Fair inspired and definitely a lot mushroom and fall inspired. So today we are going to be drawing this Rin Fair inspired girl running through the mushrooms across the moss. Can it get any more cottage core than this? I don't know. We'll have to see what I come up with for Christmas. So grab your pencils, grab your inking pens, and grab your paints, and let's get started with this illustration. I have a little post-it note sketch over to the side of what I have in mind for this illustration. Since I have kind of a hard time visualizing things in their completed form, I find working from thumbnails to be really helpful. It can be a super duper simple sketch. So what I'm starting out by doing is I'm kind of transposing my thumbnail sketch into my Canson watercolor sketchbook using really faint red lead. I'm using Pentel red lead and I'm using a Muji mechanical pencil and I'm kind of holding the mechanical pencil off to the side so that I'll draw a little bit lighter and also so that it's a little bit easier on my hand. Once I have the idea kind of sketched out onto the page, it's time to start actually refining the details and figuring things out construction wise. I'm using a method called volumetric construction. I have a lot of tutorials where I show you guys how to draw all kinds of things using volumetric construction. And then once I have the base of the figure sketched in very lightly, I can start blocking in the clothes. Now, I did have an idea in mind of what I wanted the clothes to look like. I also looked up a few reference images on Pinterest that I'm also kind of referencing as I'm sketching along. And I am also just kind of thinking about the clothes volumetrically as well. See, clothes take up space, clothes take up mass, and the way clothes are designed to hang on the body can vary and it can really change the shape of the body underneath it. That's why it's very helpful if you're just kind of getting into drawing clothing to reference clothing as you're drawing rather than just trying to draw from your imagination or from your memory. And the more clothing studies you do, the easier it's going to be. So I wanted this little illustration to have a real sense of movement and motion. So we have a lot of moving items going on, even though this is a fairly simple illustration. We have her hair, which is both moving with her, and then there's also some inertia that's causing the hair behind her to kind of flare out and you know, cloud out as well. We are showing movement with the motion of her dress, how it's kind of kicked up in the front and then it also kind of follows behind her. We're showing motion and movement with her body pose. One leg is in front of the other. We have mushrooms falling out of her basket. We have a lot of kind of thrust for drawing the movement. And if you struggle to draw people in motion, it is, it's really challenging to do. And I would highly recommend that you do some figure studies from reference, ballet, yoga, karate, running, do some studies of the Moybridge photography. All of that can be really helpful for getting a sense of movement. Now, even for her shoes, I'm referencing these, and these are some boots that I found on Pinterest that I thought would work really well for a miniature person such as this. And I am also referencing the mushrooms. Now, I don't know off the top of my head what kind of mushrooms they are. They're supposed to be edible mushrooms. I'll try to remember to link in the description below what these are, but I am actually drawing a specific type of mushroom that I'm going to be referencing throughout the whole illustration. So they look as realistic as possible in a cartoony form like this. Now, once I've got everything kind of figured out, I can start drawing a little harder with the red lead to add in further details. I am inking this piece with a Sakura Pigma FB brush pen. Those of you who've watched my start to finish tutorials, y'all know how much I like these brush pens. They're alcohol marker safe, they're water safe. They are capable of really thin lines. They're capable of much thicker lines. They're just good all rounder brush pits. If you're not confident with using a brush pen, 
that's fine. I do encourage you to give them a try and give them some practice. They take some getting used to, but they are so much fun to ink with and they're so much faster than fine liners. But you could use a fine liner for this or if you're feeling particularly brave, you could use a dip pen or you could use a brush to ink this. And I have tutorials on how to use all of those different inking materials. I'll try to remember to link them all in the description below, as long as provide a list of the materials that I use for this start to finish tutorial. Now, typically with these start to finish tutorials, I time lapse everything by about 4x. This time I time lapse everything by about 8x because for some reason, this illustration just took me longer than many of my other start to finish illustrations. So I spent about two days painting this illustration and I spent one evening sketching and inking this illustration. And after I inked this, I allowed the inks to cure overnight for about 12 hours before I started painting this. I then scanned it and I have the principal coloring sheet up on my Patreon for my amazing patrons. If you guys would like to paint along with me and just relax, I have it up there for you guys at patreon.com slash natosoup. And um, I didn't bother to really erase the red lines. I have found that with watercolor, when I paint on top of them, they kind of disappear into the background and are far less noticeable. So I really like this approach for these sort of watercolor sketches in my inexpensive watercolor sketchbook because they are much more immediate than my usual watercolor process. It's much faster for me to be able to do these sort of smaller illustrations. So for my inking process, I started with the most important part, the part you would notice the most if I messed it up, her face. You do that while your hand is fresh, before it gets tired, and while you still have that attention to detail. Then I moved on to foreground to background. So we then ink the mushrooms that are in front of her first, and then we ink the basket that's in front of her. Now we're inking her arms since they're crossing over her body, and you guys can kind of get the gist from there. Now, the beautiful thing about brush pens like this is that a really light pressure, a really light line weight implies lightness. It implies being closer to the light source or weighing less, or it can also imply being further away in the distance, like distance is kind of obscuring your ability to see the object. Heavier line weights can imply shadow. It can also imply heavier objects such as rocks, and it can also imply importance or how close the image is to the viewer. Feel free to mix and match these different techniques and approaches when you're inking so that you can ink something that you really like. And I really recommend you practice, practice, practice. The best way to get good at inking is to look at other inked works of art and comics and manga are a fantastic resource for this and to just practice and work on finding your own style. Put the mileage in and you will see improvement. And I also recommend you do some style studies. So look at how other people handle things and try to replicate that in your own style, with your own characters, with your own ideas, to your own taste. this illustration has been fully inked. I'm going to let the ink cure to the paper before I do anything. 
else to it. And I'm also going to scan it so I can share the line art on Patreon. So today I am painting with my ginormous Daily Driver watercolor palette. I promise you do not need a palette this huge. You don't have to use the specific brand that I'm using. Feel free to paint or color along with whatever you have at home. So I am mixing up a background color and I started with a burnt umber and an ultramarine blue, which makes a really nice sort of granulating Payne's gray. And I decided to add some Schmincke random gray. And this is actually manufactured when they're cleaning out all of their manufacturing equipment. This is the leftover pigments. So it can vary in color from year to year. And this year's batch is just a really beautiful granulating gray that I thought would make for a fun, moody, and kind of fall inspired background. We've been getting a lot of rain here in Southeast Louisiana. So I wanted to kind of capture how we see fall down here. We don't get the beautiful fall color that a lot of the U.S. gets. We get a lot of rain, a lot of mushrooms, and a lot of really beautiful bright green moss. And that's what I wanted to kind of convey with this little illustration here. I'm going to use that same background gray on the stones that she's running across down at the bottom. And I'm going to use these Chinese watercolor weights to help hold my watercolor paper down. You can also use a clip. You can use some good sized pebbles. Basically anything that works well as a paperweight will work well to hold down your watercolor sketchbook paper. Once the first layer has dried, I've decided I need to do and need a little bit of a darker color to capture those gray skies in the background. So I'm using a watercolor quill to apply my next layer. So I am painting in a cellulose watercolor sketchbook. This is the Canson XL watercolor sketchbook. It's what I've been using for all of my start to finish tutorials. They're very easy to find. They're fairly inexpensive and they're kind of just good little workhorses for alcohol marker or for watercolor. They're a good little mixed media watercolor sketchbook and they're pretty inexpensive and I really like how accessible they are. Um, the problem with cellulose paper like this is that the water and the pigments just sit on top of the paper as you guys can see here. So you're going to want to work in a less humid environment, which may mean you want to turn on a fan, you want to turn on the heater, you want to get some airflow going. So for the moss that she's running across, I am starting out with a little bit of a greenish gold color and I added a little additional gold to it to get it really kind of bright and poppy and to kind of contrast against the background. Now while that moss is drying, I'm going to start on my mushrooms and like I mentioned earlier, I am heavily referencing one specific type of mushroom for this. So these are based on real world edible mushrooms. I'll have the name for you guys down in the description below. And I am utilizing a wet into wet technique for this. And I'm using three different watercolor brushes. So we have the main brush, which is applying the main base color, which is a really, really light mix. Then while that's still wet, we are dabbing in our burnt sienna using another brush. And then we are dabbing in some sepia using our third brush. This is kind of a more advanced technique, but it's great for impatient people like me or for folks who like to use wet into wet techniques. This way you're not spending time and wasting paint, rinsing off your brush to grab another color. You can work with three colors and three brushes all at the same time. So for the moss down at the bottom, I am using a light wash of Daniel Smith's Undersea Green. This is a beautiful granulating green. You guys see me use this a lot when we're painting mosses like this. It's got hints of gold and indigo in it. And since those are colors that I want to use in this illustration, it's going to help tie things together. I'm working with kind of a limited color palette here, and I'm going to be repeating and referencing the same colors over and over again. We're going to see gold, we're going to see reddish browns, and we're going to see indigos, and we're going to see a lot of brown in this illustration. And that's kind of how I handle color theory, is I work with fairly limited palettes, and I keep echoing the same colors over and over again again. So for the stems on the mushrooms, I let the caps dry a bit. You guys can see that the colors have faded and lightened up quite a bit. 
that's a thing with watercolors. You know, the first layer is going to be so bright, so colorful, so saturated. It's going to like scintillate on the eye. But as it dries, it's going to kind of flatten out and it's not going to be as saturated as it was before. So we are doing wet into wet on the bottoms of the stems as well, using our base brown that we mixed and adding in a little bit of sepia at the bottom. Now, since my moss is dried, I can go in with a thicker mix of our undersea green. So I am both working from my half pan and I am also kind of dabbing it off and mixing in some of our prior undersea green mix so that we get this more saturated green color and we can really kind of build up the color depth. Now the trick with watercolor as you add your layers is not to cover every single layer the exact same amount that you covered the layer before. You want to leave some hints of those prior layers still visible. So back to our mushrooms, the bases have had a chance to dry. So I'm going in again with our base color with a little bit of sepia and I am kind of adding the sepia in wet into wet underneath the caps, underneath the collars. And I'm also reintroducing it into the base of the mushrooms. So with our mushrooms, I'm going to be doing a lot of layering like this, where I apply a base color, I dab in some wet into wet, I allow it to dry, I layer it over again. So for her eyes, with the whites of her eyes, I'm going to use a couple of layers of ultramarine blue. This is a warmer blue, just so that I'm not leaving the whites of her eyes the white of the paper. That would be a little bit too stark, a little bit too much contrast, and it would be very noticeable. It would also make her eyes look unfinished. Now, the cool thing about using that red lead as the underdrawing is for things like skin and even around the eyes, anywhere there's blood vessels, it's actually going to make it look a little bit more lively. It's going to add a little bit of warmth to your illustration. Now you can use erasable or water soluble color pencils if you want to for this. And you can be strategic about what colors you're using where so that when they melt into what you're doing, they really add a lot and they add a lot of color and do a lot of the coloring for you early on. That's definitely an option. I opted to go with red for this because it's a warmer toned illustration and the red's just going to kind of complement everything that I'm doing. It's not going to stand out. It's not going to make the skin tone a weird color or add some weird contrast. Now with the moss, I'm dabbing in a little bit of a cool blue here and there to create shadows on the moss. And um, it's really not a whole lot, just very, very faint. You can barely see in the tutorial that I did it here. And I'm also trying to lift off up some of the sepia. So I have a clean, wet brush. I'm dabbing some water onto some of the scales on the mushroom, letting the water sit just a little bit, and then trying to lift it back up using a paper towel. Sometimes this is successful, sometimes it's not. Sometimes we're going to need to go in with a bit of gouache to kind of add that lightness in later. It really kind of depends on the paints and the paper and what the atmosphere is doing that day. So when you're painting with watercolor, you have three main components. You have your paints, you have your brushes, and you have your paper. And I feel like you can afford to be cheap with two of those three things, but you can't be cheap with all three of those things. So today I'm being cheap with my paper. We're using the Canson XL watercolor paper, like I mentioned. I am using professional grade watercolors from various different brands that I happen to like that I have dried into half pans. As you guys can see here, this is a custom homemade palette, both the palette itself as well as the paint choice in it. And I have found that working from dried tube watercolors is just more economical for me. And then I am working with various quills as well as round brushes. So the quills are the brushes you guys see that have like an old timey look to them. They have a plastic collar and then they also have little metal wire holding that together. These are actually very inexpensive 
for quills, which can be very expensive quills. In fact, I reviewed these a while back and really liked them. They are the Diane W or the Art Secret quills with a Paul Rubens quill in there. And then I'm also using silver black velvet watercolor brushes. And those are mixed fiber watercolor brushes. So they are both natural hair and synthetic hair. But you know, what kind of brushes you like to paint with, what kind of brushes you find work well for you, that totally depends on who you are as an artist, what your preferences are, what you can afford, what you have access to. So I encourage you to experiment, to play around and find what works for you. But also don't worry about having the best of the best supplies. Use what you have. You can always build up a collection of nicer supplies or supplies that you need as you go along. So I have started painting her skin tone as well as the little edible button mushrooms in her basket. For her skin tone, it is a mix of burnt sienna with a little bit of yellow ochre. I'm also doing a little bit of underpainting on her overdress. I wanted to do a plaid for her overdress. And the thing about doing surface design in watercolor is sometimes it can be hard to do shading with that. So sometimes it's helpful to do some underpainting, grise, which would be with a gray, or you could do a blue or a brown underpainting just to add those shadows in early and to start toning those shadow areas so that it's a little bit easier to handle the shading later on. For her overskirt, I'm starting with a gold color. This is a mix of Indian yellow and quinacridone gold. And I'm starting kind of light to begin with while I kind of figure out how dark I want this color to be before I start adding the plaid tones. Now I've grabbed a little bit more of our quin gold. This is going to be a darker, richer sort of gold color. And I am layering that on top of the first layer since it dried not quite as saturated and dark as I would have liked. And I'm going to add in a little bit more saturated Quin Gold wet into wet in the areas that would have a bit of cast shadow to them. I'm going to use our underpainting technique. This would be Blue in this instance because we are using Indigo for this. And I'm going to use that to start knocking in more of the shadows on things that I'm not quite sure yet what color I want them to be. I'm adding in another layer on her skin tone and one of the problems I had with this illustration is that I was painting over the course of a couple of fairly humid days which meant that the watercolor itself took longer to dry since we're painting on a cellulose it's going to dry by evaporation rather than being sucked into the fibers and also I ut utilize evaporation and time to help me saturate my premixed watercolors because as the water evaporates from the wells that I'm using, the colors are going to become more saturated. So I found that I was having difficulty getting the skin tone dark enough to start indicating like shadow and to start indicating volume and to start indicating mass and form. So while I wait for things to dry and evaporate, I'm gonna start painting some of the scales on the mushroom cap. And this is another reason I really advocate that you work using reference rather than working from just your imagination. Like I like to do magical realism. I like to do a mix of fanciful and more realistic. But even if you're painting things from your imagination, you can still find real world analogs that are close to what you have in mind and use that to kind of help inspire you and help you figure out how things should look. Even if you have a cartoony art style like I do, utilizing reference so you know how things should look can be very helpful. And I find that I don't really struggle with art block all that often because I work with a mixture of from my imagination as well as from reference. So the gold that I selected for her socks and for her overskirt are going to be a contrast color for the indigo that I'm about to add to her underskirt here. And I have just mixed up kind of a basic flat wash and I'm going to just apply that to the skirt as kind of our base color.
With cellulose paper like this, there's a couple of different ways to tell whether or not you can add another layer. So one of the first ways you can tell is if it is no longer surface shiny, if it is dried kind of matte, if it has dried a little bit duller, a little bit lighter, you probably can add another layer to it. You can also use the back of your hand and lightly touch it to the paper. And if it is obviously still wet, then it's still wet. But also if it's just cool to the touch, there's still some water there and it may not be as receptive to another layer as if the paper were totally dry. That said, sometimes it's fun to add layers on top of that. Maybe it's dry, maybe it's not because it can add a little bit of chaos. It can add a little bit of blooming. It can add a little bit of visual interest to something that might otherwise look kind of flat and lifeless. So before I even started painting this illustration, I had a color palette of very fall tones in mind, reds and oranges, yellows and browns. And that's what I'm really kind of trying to work with here. Now, there are different types of reds, different types of yellows. You can have warmer reds and yellows like we're using here. You can have cooler reds and yellows like a cooler yellow, for example, would be closer to a green than it would be to an orange. So keeping your warms and your cools consistent can also help tie your palette together. So for example, with the moss down at the bottom, that would actually be considered a warmer green. It's closer to tan than it is to say a really bright, vibrant spring green. So almost all of the colors in this illustration, with the exception of the indigo kind of trend more warmer. The indigo actually kind of tends more towards a cooler green, but it kind of works in this illustration because it's kind of close in tone to the color that we used for our moss. And color theory is something I have struggled with for years. I have made a bunch of failure paintings, a bunch of failure illustrations, a bunch of failure studies. I'm not always happy with how it turns out. So even though I'm making it sound real easy, that's because I have the benefit of hindsight. I am commenting on top of a painting I've already done. So I wanted to add a plaid surface design to the top skirt to add some interest, to add some movement. The trick to doing surface design is you want to add it when your bottom layer is totally dry. And you also really want to pay attention to the forms and the folds and the movement of the cloth, because this is really going to either flatten out what you've done, or it's really going to help make all those folds and all those curves make a lot of sense. And stripes and plaids and dots are a very easy way to add this kind of visual information to give the viewer more information on how the fabric is folding, how the fabric sits on top of itself, but it can be really tricky. So I encourage you to play around with it, give it a try, work from reference, do some studies, obviously, but if it's an illustration that you really, really like and you're still not sure about your surface design and you don't want to risk it, it's okay to hold back and not risk it on the pieces that you really love it, that you really love until you're more confident in doing it. And with this one, I wasn't as successful as I would have liked to have been with the plaid. I went for it and it didn't sing as much as I wanted it to. I should have exaggerated those curves a lot more. I should have pushed the curves in the plaid to really show the form of the fabric. And I just didn't commit as much as I should have. Um, I'm still recovering from having COVID. I still have a bit of COVID brain going on. So I'm gonna give myself a pass. I'm glad I tried it. I think it does add something. I don't think it ruined it or anything, but it's not what I had originally envisioned in mind because I just didn't take the risks I should have taken. I didn't push it and cartoon it as much as I should have pushed it and cartooned it. A dot pattern would have also been cute and it would have been less noticeable, but it also wouldn't have been as, when I say it's Ren Fair inspired, like what I mean by this is it is not based on how people actually dress back then. It's not based on a specific type of dress or a specific group of people. It's very Hobbit core. It's very Moss core. It's very tiny core. It's very fantasy 
inspired. I wasn't going for like a super realistic depiction, but just kind of a vibe and something that felt kind of fun. So for the plaid, I did all of my stripes going in one direction, both the red one as well as the indigo ones, let those dry. And then I went over them again with the stripes of the same color. You can do stripes in a different color. It doesn't really matter. Um, going in the opposite direction, perpendicular, so that we get that cross effect. Now, if it had been less humid, if it had been more dry, we would have gotten these really nice crisp squares where one color crossed on top of the other, and that's called optical blending, where you have two colors that have kind of layered on top of each other to create a third color. And I apologize for the strange crinkle noise. Uh, my pet rat Basil is playing with a tinsel ball. Uh, <laughs> so now you know my secret. I often do my voiceovers while I'm hanging out and playing with Basil. So there you know, there you go. Um, so basically at this point, I have everything kind of blocked in minus her hair and her kerchief. I have most of the colors figured out. So I'm really just kind of building up detail, building up saturation, building up layers. And this is going to be kind of a matter of personal taste. How far you want to take it, how much layering and texture and detail you want to add, how realistic versus how cartoony. That's all a matter of you and what you like and what works for you. You're going to have to work to train your eye and to train your taste to what looks right. And that's just a matter of, you know, looking at art, reading comics, watching animation, playing video games with like more cartoony art or more detail art, basically building up a visual library of these sort of things. And then putting what you see and what you like into practice. It's all personal taste at this point. Now for me, I'm trying to really kind of capture those mushrooms. I want them to look semi-realistic. I don't do a whole lot of like full realism. It just isn't that appealing to me. I really like kind of capturing and caricaturing things and kind of figuring out what makes them look like those things and then simplifying it and kind of reducing it. So that's basically what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to kind of capture the stripes on the stems of the mushrooms. I'm trying to capture the scales on the mushrooms. I'm trying to build up the color depth that I see on the stalks in the reference. So for the start to finish tutorials, I try to keep the shading pretty simple. Most of the shading is going to be what's known as local color. That's going to be a more saturated version of the color that we're using for the majority of the thing, the base of the color. So for her clothing and for her skin, that's what I'm doing. I'm just for the most part working progressively more saturated. Maybe I'm adding in some more purple to the red to kind of add those shadows and build up that depth of color and build up that darkness. Usually if you want to add shadow, you can go, depending on what you're painting, you can go with a slightly cooler, darker color if you want to imply shadow. Again, that kind of depends kind of changes when we're doing skin tones and I do have more tutorials on say painting people and painting skin tones that'll help you guys out with that but that's just kind of a cheaty rule of thumb. I'm also adding in the blush to her cheeks and to her lips. Now usually I would use like a warm red for this like scarlet but for this I'm using alizarin crimson which is a cooler more bluish red just because that kind of keeps with the feeling of this image like it's a cool rainy maybe even misty fall day so by kind of keeping those colors a little bit cooler, like uh, keeping the blush a little bit cooler, keeping her hair color a little bit cooler, as we'll see in a minute, that kind of helps keep with the fall tone. 
Okay, so talking about keeping things cooler, here is a great example. We're going to do some more underpainting. I'm using indigo and I'm painting a base layer on her hair. And to be real, this indigo color looks super pretty for her hair. I could have gone more fantasy vibes. We could have gone with like a bluish black for her hair, or we could have gone with just blue for her hair, but I'm actually using this as a base color and then I'm going to paint browns and sepias on top of it. And what that's going to do is browns are typically warmer colors. It's going to cool it down and help kind of tone it to match the rest of the illustration without cooling it down too much. While I wait for her hair to dry so I can do more layers on it, I'm just going to kind of go in, add a few more details, add some more saturation, uh, just kind of nitpicking and finessing it so that it looks more like what I want. And this is like a hard thing to explain because this varies for different people. You could give a hundred different people the same illustration with the same basic color palette and you're probably going to get, unless somebody's copying off of somebody else, you're going to get a hundred different interpretations and none of them are necessarily wrong. It's a matter of taste and what looks good to you and what you want from the illustration. So I could redo this painting again and it might come out totally different. I might decide to add different shading in certain areas or I might change where I add the surface design or I might change how I handle the shading. It really just kind of depends on the person and their mood and how the paints are handling that day. So it's important to have an end vision, to have an end goal for what you want to do, but not get too caught up in it having to be exactly that end vision. It's, it's more like a mood where it can really just vary with where you're at that day and what your goals are that day and what you're capable of that day. Maybe you're having a migraine that day. Maybe you wore out your hands writing in class earlier that day. Maybe you're just tired that day. It can really kind of depend on what's going on with you. So for me, I'm trying to work on not getting so caught up in whether or not the illustration matches my end vision of what I had in mind, but whether or not I'm satisfied with it and it looks good because in the end, finished is better than perfect. Perfect is something that cannot and does not exist. It never will exist and it will keep you from making things. Finished, at least you have something that you have done, that you can learn from, that you can move on from. So for her actual hair color, we have some sepia here and you can see how the indigo actually influences the sepia under on top of it and it kind of cools it down and it's still a brownish color, but it's a more moody brownish color, kind of similar to the background. In fact, I think this base layer here is gorgeous. It looks so good. It's such a cool effect. However, it is too close to what I've got going on in the background. So while I like this effect and I'll probably try it again on another illustration in the future, it doesn't work for today's illustration. It doesn't work for today's choices. So I'm going to go in and continue to build up the browns in her hair, adding in more layers. And I'm really trying to keep the motion of how I fill in her hair matching with the motion of her hair itself, which is one of the reasons I like using round watercolor brushes. They just reflect that so well. And I'm going to also add in some black a little bit later on just to get the color as dark as I want it to be. So sometimes it is helpful for me to get a second opinion. I wasn't sure what color to make her kerchief, whether I should make it gold, red, or blue. So I solicited a second opinion and their vote was for blue. So I decided to go with blue. Getting an outside opinion, getting a fresh set of eyes on your piece, especially if you're kind of stalled out, you're not sure what to do, you're not sure where to take it, can be really helpful. So asking for a second opinion from someone you trust is a valuable artist resource source of valuable artist tool. Very few of us make art totally in seclusion, not talking to anybody else, not referencing anything else, not getting any feedback. That's just not how people make art. I don't care what your favorite art influencers are saying. That is not how people make art. 
So getting that second opinion can be really beneficial. It can help get you out of your own head. And sometimes you've been working on for some on something for so long that you don't like it. Um, and it's not because it's bad. It's because you've gotten very saturated with it. So getting that second opinion can bring you some fresh eyes and some fresh perspective. And it can help you see what you're doing right in the piece. wanted to add a little bit more shadow to this so I grabbed a watercolor pencil it's in indigo and I'm just using this to kind of help reestablish some of the shading and some of the shadow to say her overdress that has that surface pattern or to her socks and I find that using watercolor pencils and this is something I do a lot with my comic uh, it just kind of adjusts the color without ruining the color and sometimes you can just ruin the color if you do this using watercolor. By using a dry media or a dry to wet media like watercolor pencils, it can kind of balance things without ruining things. So now that I'm just about done, I want to add in some white gouache highlights. And you guys see, I'm being super gross. I am just dipping my wet brush, my clean wet brush, into my tube of white gouache, swirling it around, picking up some paint, and I'm using the white to add some highlights, to add some rim lighting. If things have gotten kind of muddied because the contrast is too similar, adding a little bit of white gouache can kind of help re realign the contrast and can help make things a little bit easier to see, a little bit more visible. There you have it, another start to finish tutorial completed. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I hope you guys had as much fun drawing, inking, and painting as I did. I really enjoyed being able to share this with you guys. I have some holiday inspired start to finish tutorials in the works, so I hope you guys will keep an eye out for that. If you wanna make sure you don't miss anything, make sure that you are subscribed and you have the bell notification clicks so that YouTube will let you know when I update. I also post about when I update on Facebook, Blue Sky, and Threads. So if you're like me and you can't trust YouTube to let you know when your favorite artists have updated, you guys can follow me over there. I'll have links to all of that down in the description below. I will also have all of the materials that I use for today's tutorial linked out for you guys in case you want to do a little bit of shopping or you want to add something to your wish list. And if you're one of my amazing patrons on Patreon, I shared the printable line art for this. So not only will you be able to color along with me if you join me on Patreon, but your support on Patreon helps me create tutorials like this one. Thank you so much to my amazing patrons for all of your help, your support, and your patience with me this year. I truly appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you guys again soon with another art supply review or tutorial. If you're looking for more arty goodness from me, check out these tutorials here, or you can join me over on my Patreon.